renewed uh, this is pastor joe coming to you on this wonderful sunday morning i want to thank each and every one of you who are joining us today uh, i hope that the word of god will touch you and change you uh, in a way that maybe it never has before if you are new here uh, i want to thank you as well uh, and i do want to ask that well when the moment comes that we get to join together again in person that maybe you will come and join us there as well before we get started i do want to take a moment to thank uh, Mr. Tyson and to thank Bay and Kinley for stepping out of their comfort zones maybe and joining in and starting and kicking off uh, the series Faces of Grace. I can promise you this, what they did was not easy. And so from the bottom of my heart, I am much appreciative uh, of their efforts and their willingness. And I do pray that God rewards their faithfulness of giving their words of encouragement and their testimony uh, because I do believe that when we step out in faith, for God, I do believe that he rewards that. Uh, make sure this week on Tuesday and Thursday, you watch the new people as they also share uh, and continue the series Faces of Grace. Today, I want to go to the book of Psalms, and we're going to go to the 92nd Psalm. And if I had a title for today's message, it would be called A Sunday Psalm. Like most Psalms, um, David is given the credit by most biblical scholars for writing the 92nd Psalm. Like most Psalms, uh, this psalm was sung. Uh, but what this psalm was a little different, it was adopted by the Jewish people, and it became basically the old-time church hymn. It became the hymn that everybody knew the words to. It became the crowd favorite, the church favorite. It became the song that if someone requested a song, it was this one. And so when David wrote the 92nd Psalm, he was writing a Sabbath song, but for us, he was writing a a Sunday song. And so let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer and let's go ahead and get into the word of God. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your many blessings. I thank you for watching over each and every one of us. Father God, I'm praying for a special hedge of protection of health around Grace for New Church. Father God, I'm asking that you will bless us and I'm praying, dear God, that you will draw us closer to you in this time of uh, difficultness. Father God, I'm asking that you will uh, have complete control in the service today. Father God, I'm asking that your will will be done. Hide me behind the cross of Calvary and let everything I say here today be in accordance to your will. We give you praise and glory and honor for all that you've done and all you're going to do. In Jesus' precious name and all God's people said, amen. The 92nd Psalm here, like I said, was a, a Sunday song. It, it was sang at church. 
and I want to do the, the scripture maybe a little different today. I actually want to read it verse by verse and kind of break it down for you. Uh, and hopefully you will be able to glean some truth from it today. Starting there in verse 1 of the 92nd Psalm, it says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto his name. See, when David wrote this and when the Jewish people sang this, that they sang it because it was good to sing. That they, they sang it because they were it was good to give thanks. See, I don't believe they were singing out of obligation. I, I don't believe they were worshiping out of obligation. And if we were honest with one another, there are times in our lives that church becomes an obligation. It, it becomes the, the thing that you do on Sunday because you're supposed to do it. See, when the Jewish people sang about the Sabbath day, or they sang on the Sabbath day, they weren't singing out of obligation. They, they were singing out of liberation. You say, well, what do you mean, Joel, about that? Well, see, the Jewish people knew what it was to be in captivity. They knew what it was to be held by Pharaoh. They knew what it was to work seven days a week. And so when they got the opportunity to walk across the Red Sea on dry ground, and they got an opportunity to walk in freedom, when they sang on the Sabbath day, they sang because they truly were a free people and they cherished the freedom. Church, they weren't singing out of obligation. They were singing because they were liberated free people. And so if there's anything that I ask that you uh, hopefully gain from this moment away from one another, I, I'm hoping that we will cherish the Sunday services together like We've never cherished them before because what we have learned in a moment's time, the things that we take for granted, they can be taken from us. The one thing that we know from on this side of eternity, there is nothing permanent. It can be gone in a twinkling of an eye. And so I'm, ask, I'm asking and I'm hoping as your pastor, and, and it is a challenge to myself that I, I don't take for granted the Sunday services that we have. I'm praying that I cherish them more. And I'm praying that when I sing, I sing because I'm a free person. And I'm hoping that you sing because you're a free people. See, my Bible says for the wages of sin is death. My Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I can rest on the Sabbath because of the work God did on the cross. Let me tell you that again. I can rest on the Sabbath, not in my own work. I can rest on the work that God did on the cross. And I sing now because just like the Jewish people, I was once held captive to a sin that I never thought I would be free from. And church, you were once held captive to a sin that you never thought you would be free from. But because of Christ's death and resurrection, I walked through that Red Sea on dry ground and I'm no longer held captive to the sin in my life and I can rejoice on the Sabbath and I'm hoping that I never take for granted the Sabbath again. And I hope that I sing a Sunday song like I've never sang it before. See, as David wrote the 92nd song, he too understood what it was to be a free man. See, most of us recognize that when Samuel anointed David, we always accredit David's uh, personality or his character to 1 Samuel 13, 14. And it says that David was a man after God's own heart. Can I tell you something about David being a man after God's own heart? That's obviously a true statement, but David wasn't always a model Christian. See, David knew what it was to feel the wrath of God. He, he knew what it was to feel the anger of God. He knew what it was to disappoint God. He knew what it was to be called out for his sin. But David writes in verse 1 that it's a good thing to give thanks because I'm sure David gave thanks to the mercy that God extended to him. I, I'm sure David gave thanks for the grace that God extended to him. I, I'm sure David gave thanks and sang praises because God was faithful to him even when he rendered himself unfaithful to God. See, David knew what it was not to be the model Christian. He too was held captive to by some sins in his life. And so too often in our lives, we forget what God has done for us because we're longing for God to do more for us. See, too often there is an unanswered prayer. Too often there is something that we need God or we think we need God to do. And, and what it tends to do, it, it tends to silence our praise and it, it tends to silence our thankfulness. See, 
I don't know about you, but I have a hard time with ungrateful or unthankful people. I, I really, truly do. But I wonder how many times I have quenched the spirit because of my selfishness and my unthankfulness and my ungratefulness. See, my Bible says that in Psalms 22, 3, that God inhabits the praise of his people. And if God inhabits the praise of his people, that means his presence is the strongest when we give him praise. And if we were always waiting for God to do the next thing before we give praise, how many times have we quenched his presence because we're not praising him for what he's done? I wonder how many times he's sitting up there on the throne and he's thinking about all the places he brought us th from. He's thought, thinking about all the storms he's calmed for us. He's thinking about all the waters he's parted for us. He's thinking about all the walls he's torn down for us. And we keep waiting for the next miracle. And God says, wait just a minute. Why don't you give me thanks for all the miracles I've already done? Church, when the Jewish people sang Psalm 92, they were giving him thanks for everything that he had done for them. See, church, if you've been granted or you have been accepted into the family of Christ and you have accepted Christ as your personal Savior, just like Israel, when God says, I inhabit the praises of Israel, that means God inhabits the praise of his people. And if he inhabits the praise of his people and you have accepted him, then you are his people. And the more you praise, the more he inhabits and the stronger his presence is around you. I'm asking you and challenging you today, stop quenching the spirit by waiting for the next miracle to praise because if you're always waiting, you're leaving out all the past miracles that he's done for you. And so David says it's good to give praise and it's good to sing. And he goes on in verse 2 and it says, To show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. See, when David says his loving kindness in the morning, he is recognizing that some pieces and some parts of life are a bed of roses. He, he's recognizing that in the morning, that's where the joy is. He's, he's recognizing that it's easy to point out God's loving kindness when all we see is God's goodness. He, he's recognizing that when you're on vacation and you're not worrying about anything, it's easy to give praise. David says, I give you praise for thy loving kindness and your goodness in the morning. But watch what David then follows up with. He says, I praise your faithfulness in the night. See, I love the morning. I love the joy that accompanies the morning. I choose the morning overnight anytime. Nights are the worst. If you've ever been sick, which obviously you have, nights seem to be when you feel the sickest. Nights are when your thoughts in your head just keep running over and over and you can't silence them. Thoughts are if you're in pain, it seems like you're in more pain. Thoughts are... When the people that you're having a hard time forgiving, those are the people that you're thinking about the most. It seems like nights are the worst. But watch what David says. David says, I give you thanks for your faithfulness in my nights because in your faithfulness, God, you have proven yourself to me. God proves his faithfulness in your weakest moments. David was saying, I have seen a lot of nights in my life. But as he wrote in the 37th Psalm, verse 25, I believe, I have been young, but now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. David was saying, I've seen and I've witnessed nights in my life, but God has truly been faithful to me every single time of that. Yes, he's good in the morning. He's good in the joyful times. But when I'm weeping, that's truly when I've seen a God step up and be faithful to me. David says, I sing of your faithfulness in the night. He goes on to say, upon an instrument of ten strings and upon a, the harp with a, a solemn sound, for the Lord has made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hand. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. But brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up as grass, so when all the workers of iniquity do flourish. It is that they shall be destroyed forever. See, David is saying here, he's saying, you know what? I've seen a lot of enemies rising up in my time. I 
I've seen a lot of bad guys that it seems like they keep on win winning. But David wanted you to know that just because a new enemy is rising up, this is like your typical Lifetime movie. Though the bad guy seems to be winning all along, at the end of this movie clip and at the end of your life, the good guy's always going to win. David is saying, I sing praise to my God because even though I have enemies in my life, my God allowed them to rise up, but he's also going to destroy them one day. See, the Jewish people sang because I believe they probably remember the day that Egypt was in control of their life. They remember when Pharaoh dictated every move that they made. I believe that they probably never thought that God would raise up a man named Moses. They probably never thought Pharaoh would let them go. They saw a new enemy rising up and the, he seemed to get stronger and stronger. The workers of iniquity seemed to flourish as they were stuck working there under their rule. But then all of a sudden, God parted a Red Sea for them. All of a sudden, they stepped out onto dry land into freedom. And they began to sing this 90-second song because they remember the day that God set them free from an enemy that seemed to be flourishing in their life. Church, if there are enemies in your life and there's something that you cannot conquer, David sang, sing praises and thankfulness anyway because there will be a moment that the enemy that has hindered your life has taken your sleep, has stolen your joy, there will be a moment that that bad guy will no longer have the capability of doing that. Sing praises today. Not that he's destroyed yet, but that he's going to be destroyed. David sang and so did the Jewish people. Because even though there were enemies present in David's life, he knew that there would be a day that Christ would win out at the end. As David fought these enemies, there, there's a verse in 2 Samuel 21, 15. It says that David waxed faint. He got tired of fighting enemies. I'm sure some of you today uh, in this moment of quarantine and this moment of virus that we talk about all the time, some of you are getting tired. I'm sure there's some other battles in your life right now that you're fighting that you're tired of fighting them. David and 2 Samuel 21, 15 was fighting a battle and it says he waxed faint. He got tired. But watch what happens in verse 10 that David sings about. It says, but my horn shall thou exalt like a horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with a fresh oil. I'm sure David remembers the day that Samuel came and found him uh, tending his father's sheep out in the field. I I'm sure David remembers the day that the oil rolled over the, the top of his head and, and down over his face and he was anointed king before he was ever really ready to be anointed king. I'm sure David remembered the time as his faithfulness and his relationship with Christ grew. But, but then there came a time that David got tired. There came a time that David failed. There came a time that David, David walked away. And David sings in the 92nd Psalm of a, a fresh anointing. He sings of a second wind. He sang knowing that though he had waxed faint, there was a God that gave him a strength that he knew nothing about. Church, and as some of you are waxing faint today and you're getting tired, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you that there is a fresh anointing on the way. I want you to sing praises to the strength that God is going to give you. My Bible says in Isaiah 40, 31, that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, church. There's a fresh anointing for those that wait. And David sang because he had witnessed a fresh anointing over and over and over. See, David sang a fresh anointing that maybe hadn't come yet, but that he knew that it was coming. Listen to what David goes on and says in verse 11. He says, my eyes also shall see the, my desire of my enemies and my ears shall hear. He was talking about the destruction of his enemies. He's saying, my eyes are going to see it. My ears are going to hear it. It's not happening yet. 
See, David was talking about this a fresh anointing that he got during the battle. He was talking about the second wind that he got to fight the enemy. And he says, though I have not seen the victory yet, I know the victory's coming. That though I have not conquered it yet, I, I know there will be a day that I will be more than a conqueror. See, I'm reminded of Second or First Kings 18.41 when Elijah takes the prophets of Baal up and they have the fire contest and they have the sacrifice. And after the end of it, when God showed up and he consumed the altar with his all-consuming fire, Elijah sends his servant up on the mountaintop. And he says, what do you see? And the servant comes back and says, I see nothing. And he sends him again and he comes back and says, I see nothing. And he comes back one more time and he said, I see nothing. Elijah says, go check again. And the servant comes back and says, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. Elijah said, there's rain coming. See, there had been a drought for over three years. The drought wasn't over yet, but Elijah was prophesying that there was rain coming. See, David, when he's singing this psalm, he hasn't been given victory over every enemy of his life, but he's singing because he knows the victory is coming. And Elijah looks at Ahab and says, I hear an abundance of rain on its way. Church, I think there is an abundance of rain on the way. I believe that when we meet again together in person, I believe that we will have a service like we've never experienced before. I believe the presence of God will fall upon us like he's never fallen before. I believe there is a sound of abundance of rain. And though we do not have complete victory over this enemy that we're fighting today, there is victory on the way and our eyes shall see it as David sang. Our ears shall hear it as David sang. Don't walk away from the fresh anointing. Don't walk away from the present victory and the future victory. Hold on until the abundance of rain begins to sound upon your ear, church. There's a second anointing coming and David sang about that second anointing and he sang about the victories to come. And as he goes on there in verse 12, it says, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like cedar in Lebanon. And in verse 13, I want to spend just a moment of time on verse 13. He says, those that be planted. We are currently in, in planting season. Uh, in fact, Rachel and I, we, we have this little area that we like to call a garden. Uh, most of the time we just grow a lot of weeds, but we call it our garden right now. And in fact, yesterday uh, we went out to our little garden area and, and we planted some seeds. And we, we hoed the little rows and we put the seeds in. And then Rachel got on, I got a magic marker and we put a little stick in the ground and, and wrote on uh, the stick exactly what we had planted in the rows. So that if we are fortunate enough that something will grow in there, that when it starts to sprout, we'll know exactly what we put there. See, we didn't plant it by accident. See, farmers, they, they don't plant by accident. Gardeners don't plant by accident. They just don't broadcast their seed and, and hope it comes up. They don't plant their seed and then walk away from it and then come back months later expecting to find a harvest. No, when you are planted, you are divinely placed somewhere. And David says, those that be planted. Church, the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you were planted. You were planted. In fact, my Bible goes on earlier, I believe it's in Jeremiah, that he says, I loved you before you were even in your mother's womb. God thought about what seed he was planting in you. That's why it says that his plan is for all to come to repentance. See, he planted a seed. And church, you are planted in a specific spot. Just like Ruth, Ruth in the Bible, it says that she was made for an exact purpose like this. You are planted for an exact purpose that you're going through. You were planted in the exact job that you're at. You were planted in the exact church that you attend. You are planted in the exact marriage that you're holding. You were planted. The people that 
are surrounding you. You have been planted there. See, gardeners don't plant by accident. Farmers don't plant by chance. They plant in a spot that they're sure there'll be no, enough water. There'll be enough sun. There may have to be enough shade and they come back over and over to check on their plant to make sure that it's growing and they may throw some fertilizer. They may pull some weeds. They, they, make, they may have to prune. They, they do whatever they need to do to make sure that their seed is growing. To be planted in the house of God as David sang about means that you are planted by the greatest gardener of all time. See, God was a gardener long before he was a carpenter. Let me take you back to Genesis. Genesis says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and we find that he created a garden first on this earth. He created a garden and he specifically planted a garden in Eden. But the garden was empty and it needed a caretaker. And so God scoops down a thing of dirt and he puts a seed in it. And that seed's name was Adam. And he begins to form man out of his garden. He had planted him there. And he looks at his most prized possession that he grew from his dirt. And he specifically put him in the Garden of Eden to do a job. And then he plants Eve next to Adam and he gives them full control over the garden. And he didn't walk away from Adam and Eve in the garden. No, he communed with them daily. He met them in the quiet of the evening and they talked together and they walked together. He checked on them. He made sure they had enough food and he, he nourished them. See, he didn't walk away from them, church, when he planted somebody. And then there came a day that Adam actually walked away from God. And Eve walked away from God. And God didn't walk away from the garden then. No, he went back into the garden and he found Adam and Eve in the place that they were at. It's mighty to know, it's powerful to know that God always comes and finds us the place that we're at. And he clothed them. But because of their sin, there was a price and a consequence of it. And they were kicked out of the garden and, and life changed for them. But God didn't, God didn't walk away from them. No, he continued to nourish them. He continued to take care of them. He continued to make sure that they had enough of what they needed. He, he continued to care for them. But then something happened. God, God wanted to care for them even a little more because he knew that the consequences or the wages of sin was death. And so what does God do? He goes back into the garden. But this time he does a little something different in the garden. Instead of planting a seed named Adam, he plants himself. You said, Joe, I'm having a hard time following you. Well, a couple weeks ago, we talked about a tomb that was located next to a garden. See, God planted the human race in the garden and he saved the human race in the garden. He planted Adam in the garden of Eve, but he planted himself in the garden of resurrection. And when he planted the guard himself in the garden of resurrection, my Bible says that when we accept Christ as our personal savior, we are crucified with Christ. That means we are planted beside him. In John 15, I believe it's verse five, God, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. That means we have been planted and we are growing together. But I'm not planted as Adam was planted, a fallen creature. No, when I am planted next to Christ in a resurrection garden, I'm planted free from the captivity of sin because I can rest and sing a Sunday song because of the resurrection of Christ. He is, not, he is no longer separate from me, but he has grafted me in with him. 
And as he grows, I grow. And as he goes, I go. He is the vine. I'm just the branch. I've been planted in the garden of Christ, church. And as David says, those that be planted, he's talking about the ones who are growing and allowing Christ to be their vine. Because where you're planted, church, that's where you put your roots down. And if you allow yourself to be planted in the house of God, as David sang about, that means your roots are growing deep into the foundation of Christ. That means you can be like Psalm 1-3 that says, I am planted like the one by the living waters. And in the season of drought, I will still have harvest. See where you're planted, church, that's where you're getting your life from because that's where your roots are at. Church, I want to be planted in the house of God. I want to be planted in the presence of God. And too many times I believe that Christ plants us. But because we haven't recognized that we've been planted, we uproot ourselves. How many times have we walked away from a garden that God has planted us in? How many times have we walked away from a group of people that God has planted us next to? How many times have we given up on something because we didn't think that there was any purpose for the place that we were at, but if we had truly recognized, God planted you there. Church, I want you to think about where you found yourself right now. And if you have found yourself in a situation that you're having a hard time understanding, let me tell you something. If you're living in Christ, and Christ is living in you, that means he's planted you. And you are exactly where you're supposed to be. You're exactly where you're supposed to do, be. But to be planted means you must die. Because for a seed to give life, it must die first. But my Bible says we die with Christ. When Christ died, we died. But as Christ resurrected himself, he also resurrected us. And because he planted us, we can begin to flourish and begin to grow into the thing that God expects us to be and wants us to be. Church, don't get anxious and uproot yourself from a place that you think you can't be used because if you're in the will of God, you are being planted there. Watch what David says, those that be planted, they shall bring forth fruit in old age. See, that, that, that's not possible. The older you get, the older the plant gets. Eventually, it starts losing its ability to produce fruit. The older a tree gets, eventually it loses its ability to produce acorns or, or nuts or whatever. Eventually, the older you get, you lose your ability to produce a harvest. But David said, not those that are planted in the house of God. Those that are planted in the house of God, they will flourish and have a harvest from the time that they accepted Christ until the time Christ calls them home. And so whether you are one year old or you're 101 years old, if you've been planted in the house of Christ and God hasn't called you home yet, there is still a harvest in your life. And David sang because of it. And he worshiped because of it. And he gave thanks because of it. And the 92nd Psalm closes with this, and it says, To show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Church, if you've rooted yourself in Christ, no man can uproot you from that. If you're planted next to the true vine, no man can pluck you from that. If you've been planted in the resurrection garden, you can sing because of the freedom of sin. Church, David sang not because life was perfect. He sang because he had seen God's goodness. The Jewish people sang because they had experienced the freedom. Not that life was perfect, no, but they knew that faithfulness was in the night. They sang because of the Sundays that they had. And here is my challenge to you and uh, as a church and to myself. I want you to begin to pray that we will be able to join together um, soon.
that we will be able to meet in person. But I also pray that we will cherish the Sabbath, the, the Sunday. We will cherish it and we will sing a Sunday song. And we will worship like we've never worshipped before. And we will praise him like we've never praised him before. Because of what he's done for us. May we not take for granted the goodness of God nor the faithfulness of God. And may we remember that in the end, the good guy always wins. The good guy always wins. Hey church, thanks for joining me this morning. I, I hope you learned a little bit about the 92nd Psalm. I, I pray that you'll go back and, and read it again today or tomorrow and that you will take a moment to give thanks and be grateful for what God has done for you. Hey, I'm praying that we will see each other soon and that we will sing a Sunday song together. Let us close in prayer. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to present your word. I pray, dear God, that you will bring us together um, once again so we can sing praises in your house. But Father, I am thankful for the ability to still be able to give out the word and that we can still have church. So thank you for that, dear Lord. Father God, be with us throughout this week. Um, let us see the opportunities that we've been planted in. And Father God, let us see that we are going to produce a harvest. We give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen and amen. Hey church, don't forget on Tuesday and Thursday of this week, check out uh, the next Face of Grace. Hey, I love you, I miss you, and I can't wait to see you one Sunday. God bless and take care. I won't.